<laughs> okay, so uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, welcome to those on the other end. Um, today we're starting on lecture seven um, of my part of the post, and we're going to talk about ultralight axions, ULAs, in the cosmic, cosmic micro background of the large scale structure. So to um, just very briefly recap, yesterday, yesterday we talked about um, cosmological data, um, how, we, how we use it, um, Bayesian analysis, Markov chain Monte Carlo, uh, and then we introduced the cosmic micro background spectrum, what, how that comes about as a good example of how cosmologists um, extract constraints and measure parameters. And we use that as a pace to place a kind of zero order constraint on um, all axion models um, from the Isokovitcher power spectrum. So we looked at the shape of the CMB, which uh, for those of you looking at the board, um, is on the board, the kind of famous shape with the first peak and then other peaks decaying afterwards. And we use this shape, which is characteristic of inflation um, and inflation or anything with an adiabatic initial um, conditions to place constraints on these other modes, particularly the iso curvature mode, and axions in this scenario B for, post, for, uh, for the Petri Quinn symmetry broken during inflation. This lecture we're going to use uh, the CMB and other measures of, um, of cosmological structure to place constraints on ultralight axions and thus measure the... We're going to really start to make contact with what Jens is talking about. We're going to establish this 10 to the minus 22 EV is a relevant scale. Why is this consistent with the large scale structure of the universe? <laughs> and we're going to place constraints on the density of axions at lower masses. So, um, reading for this part, uh, chapters five and six in my review. Um, this, uh, this paper by Mendel and Barbieri from about um, almost 15 years ago um, really does like the first precision cosmology job um, of constraints on axion masses and densities. This is a WMAP, um, WMAP1 data, um, some Lyman Alpha Forest, other measures of large scale structure. And then these two um, papers by myself, Rene Rajek, Dan Green, Pedro Ferreira, which do the, the details of the CMB analysis. And then many other papers that I'll talk about, but you'll see the references on the slides. <laughs> Okay, so to return to this plot that we looked at um, many lectures ago, I think in either three or four, what are the scales in this problem? So axion dark matter is produced dominantly non-thermally by the realignment mechanism, which we spent a long time talking about in lecture four. And this is a non-thermal process. So what we do is we compare the axion mass to the Hubble scale. This is the scale when the field goes from being relativistic to non-relativistic, not the temperature, Hubble. So Hubble's controlling the friction in the klein gordon equation. Okay, so this is the scales in the problem. Here's the axion mass drawn on an axis. At the bottom, I'm gonna tell you what physics is going on. Um, and below, I'm gonna tell you what physics is going on and what the scale of the Hubble constant is. We're going from left to right, from early times to late times. So the Hubble constant is going to be larger on the left and smaller on the right. Okay. The, the scale, the first scale that we can hang down is Big Bang nucleosynthesis. During Big Bang nucleosynthesis, the temperature is one mega electron volt um, and the Hubble parameter is about 10 to the minus 15 EV. All the scales with Hubble constant larger than this are essentially unknown. Inflation could still be going on or there could be a matter-dominated epoch or a radiation epoch. And there are many things that are subject to uncertainties of ultraviolet physics. This is very relevant for the QCD axiom. This is essentially why we have this uncertainty about scenario A, scenario B, Petri Quinn symmetry breaking through the QCD axiom. But anything lighter than 10 to the minus 15 EV, we know the expansion history of the universe from here on. So there's no uncertainty to do with entropy production or expansion rates or anything like this. So the next scale we can pin is today, the Hubble scale today, 100 kilometers per second per megaparsec times the dimensionless Hubble parameter is about 10 to the minus 33 electron volts. 
anything lighter than 10 to the minus 33 electron volts is still overdamped by the Hubble friction in the Klein Gordon equation and basically contributes to lambda. And we're not going to be concerned with excellent dark energy in these lectures. What other scales can we nail? The next easiest one is matter radiation equality. Matter radiation equality happened when the temperature was about one electron volt, the redshift was about 3300, plus the Hubble scale, 10 to the minus 28 electron volts. Actions in between these 10 to the minus 28, 10 to the minus 33 electron volts, they're somewhat, they're somewhat like dark energy, somewhat, somewhat like massive neutrinos, in the sense that they were relativistic for some part of the matter epoch and then went non-relativistic during the matter epoch. Um, however, different from neutrinos, when they were relativistic, their equation of state was minus one rather than one third because it's just dark energy like behavior. Anything heavier than 10 to minus 20 electron volts can properly be called dark matter, which contributing to the matter density at matter radiation equality. Question is, how much of it is there? So we can also say, what was the Hubble rate when the scales that are just going nonlinear today first entered the horizon? The scales that are going nonlinear today, 0.1 inverse megaparsec um, in, in wave number, first entered the horizon when the Hubble scale was about 10 to minus 24 electron volts. So we know that most of the dark matter has to be heavier than 10 to minus 24 electron volts then, because we know that dark matter forms nonlinear structure. But in this window, in this window of about nine orders of magnitude, 10 to the minus 24 to 33, our axions are only going to be clustering linearly. That's because they were relativistic. Or they, were, they were still relativistic when the nonlinear scales today entered the horizon. So they were free streaming, if you like, although that's not quite, quite the correct phrase. They were pressure supported on those scales. So they were, they're not forming nonlinear structure. But the bonus of that, is we can use linear observables to constrain the energy density in this region, and we can try and probe the gut scale in a way that I'll show um, in a few slides' time and again next lecture. Everything in between here, 10 to the minus 24, 10 to the minus 15 EV, we have to work a lot harder to constrain. This has been the focus of, of the ENSYS lectures, and I'll also talk about all the way down to about 10 to the minus 10 in the next lecture. These guys affect nonlinear structure, galaxy formation, we need to use the halo model, a somewhat warm dark matter like. But when it comes to direct detection, they're also particularly challenging in this fuzzy dark matter regime um, between 10 to the minus 22, 10 to the minus 15 EV. That is because 10 to the minus 15 electron volts is about a hertz if you convert it into frequency. So, the, so these fields, their natural frequency is between a hertz and about 10 to the minus seven hertz. So they are very hard to search for from direct detection, and we'll address that in lecture 10. Okay, so we've got, our, we've got our bounds. We can do precision cosmology, which will be the focus of the first half of today's lecture in the range 10 to the minus 22 to 10 to the minus 33 electron volts, because things are either linear or quasi-linear, so we can really compute our cosmological observables well. But at 10 to the minus 22 electron volts, this is the the genes mass is approximately the size of dwarf galaxies. We know most of the dark matter has to be heavier than 10 to the minus 22 EV because dwarf galaxies exist. Um, but we'd like to improve this bound and place constraints on this fuzzy dark matter model. So this has been the main focus of the ENSYS lectures. So today we're going to do 10 to the minus 33 to 10 to the minus 22 and precision cosmology. Okay, so uh, the cosmic microwave background the cosmic microwave background, if you remember our, um, our anatomy of it that um, was given yesterday, it's still on the blackboard for those of you here. So the CMB, you can, you can see it, well, I, I like to see it in, the, in these terms as measuring the expansion rate of different epochs. And so anything that changes the expansion rate away from what it is in Lambda CDM is probed by the CMB. So for example, on the plot here, um, I showed how the first peak is controlled by the distance to the surface of last scattering. So that probes kind of dark energy dynamics and the expansion rate in the matter era. And then the heights of all the higher acoustic peaks are dependent on the silk damping, the diffusion damping during the radiation era in the plasma that formed the CMB. And the diffusion damping scale, how far the diffusion um, 
the diffusion, the diffusion process goes, the drag um, is basically controlled by the expansion rate during the radiation era. So these are the two nice splits and measure curvature and all these kinds of things. So these are some things that, um, on the slide now that you could do to change dark matter, to change the expansion rate and just try and measure it in the cosmic microwave background. You could have sterile neutrinos. They have an equation state to third at early times when they're relativistic, and then it goes to zero when the temperature drops below the mass. When they go non-relativistic, you could have a complex scalar field. Now, a complex scalar field behaves very differently from a real scalar field like the axiom. Complex scalar field has a conserved U1 charge, and thus it has rotational modes. If it doesn't have a spontaneous symmetry breaking potential, it has Rotational modes are angular momentum supported in field space, and they have equation of state one, and then transitions to a third, and then zero. So it's a complex scalar with a phi squared plus phi to the four non-symmetry breaking potential. So this has um, a stiff phase, gravitational waves are dominate, uh, amplified at any times. This has been studied um, in a series of papers by Baiju Li, Tanya Rindler Dalla, and Paul Shapiro. I won't talk about it very much. And then there's our case here, the axiom on the real scalar. It has equation of state minus one at early times when it's friction dominated, and then transitioning to zero when the Hubble scale is ordered the mass. So this is what we're going to try and constrain using the CMB right now. The first two um, affect the peaks only, because they affect their large equations of state affecting the radiation era. And the, the last one, the real scalar, can kind of do both. It can affect the peak structure if it undergoes this transition H order M in the matter era, but not too, but, uh, sorry, in the radiation era, but not too deep in the radiation era. Or it can affect the location of the first peak, the angular size and the sound horizon, if it undergoes this transition in the matter era. Okay, so first of all, here is the, our axioms heavier than 10 to the minus 27 EV. They undergo their transition from, um, rather from W equals minus one to W equals zero in the radiation era. So we can properly call them dark matter. That means we can fix the Hubble rate, the dark energy density, and hold the large scale CMB, the low multipoles, completely fixed. We don't change the Satchwell plateau at all. But as I, so my, my plots here are, Axial mass beginning at 10 to the minus 27 EV with the red dotted line. And then I make, I fix these axioms to be all of the dark matter. And then in the lines going up from dotted red to solid green, I increase the mass. So that means that the transition from W equals minus one to W equals zero is moving further and further back into the radiation era. As we move further and further back into the radiation era, the radiation is more and more dominant. The density is increasing over matter, like, like the scale factor, like one over the scale factor. So as I increase the axion mass, this, the transition happens when they're increasingly subdominant. So they have a smaller and smaller effect on the expansion rate. So that's what you see is, if I have the transition right at matter radiation equality, I make a big change to the expansion rate compared to CDM, as I increase the axial mass, these effects go away. You can barely see them relative to the size of the data points here. Once I get to a mass of 10 to the minus 24 EV, then you really just overlap with the lambda CDM curve and the data points. So I'll just sketch on the board what I need. Mean. So I've got the uh, log of the energy density and the log of the scale factor. And you've got radiation going like 1 over a to the 4. CDM would go like 1 over a cubed. Overlap of matter radiation equality. <laughs> These axioms I'm introducing have their transitions here, here, here. I'm moving the transition as I increase the axial mass back to smaller values of the scale factor. But, the, but then you're increasingly subdominant to the radiation. So the expansion rate increasingly doesn't see the effect of that change. So the heavier axions, the effect vanishes compared to lambda CDM, and you just approach lambda CDM as you take the axion mass to infinity. Where in this context, 
quotient of 2 infinity is 10 to the minus 24 electron volts. Okay, the next regime we can look at is actually lighter than about 10 to the minus 27 electron volts. That is when now this transition is occurring in the, in the matter era. So now I can't really call these things dark matter. So instead, I'm going to keep the amount of dark matter fixed. I'm going to hold matter radiation equality fixed at a redshift of 3300. And so introducing these axions, I'm effectively taking away some of the, some of the cosmological constant and replacing it with an axion. So now I'm just going to redraw the same plots. In this case, log of the energy density, log of the scale factor. I'm now interested in the matter area, so I've just got the matter going like 1 over a cubed, and I've got cosmological constant as a constant. So I'm holding the total density fixed like this in the cosmological constant. But what I'm, what I'm effectively doing is I'm introducing an axiom that has to then transition and join this density. Okay? So now if I decrease the mass, I have to move this back. <laughs> and so as I, so, so now as I decrease the axial mass, the, this, this model increasingly starts to resemble the cosmological constant. And eventually, once I have a mass less than 10 to the minus 33 electron volts, you'll just be a cosmological constant still today. The field's still frozen by Hubble friction. So that's what's happening here. I, I start off with an axial mass of 10 to the minus 30 electron volts in the bottom, in the dot of gold. And I have the density in this axion being about being half the density in the dark matter. So it's like so some fraction of the cosmological constant density. Because now for this 10 to the minus 30, the axion, this transition occurs quite, quite a long time ago in the matter era. I change the distance to the surface of last scattering compared to lambda CDM by quite a lot. I take out basically a fair amount of the cosmological constant because now in this case, say 10 to the minus 30 electron volt, 30 electron volts, my axion transitions to matter before today. So some fraction of what was the cosmological constant is now in something that's behaving like matter. So I really change the distance to the surface of last scattering a lot. So you see I change the location at the first peak. Don't change the peak structure at higher peaks. And I also change, because of this, this is a kind of dark energy dynamics, I change the time dependence of the Newtonian potential, which appears in the integrated Sackle-Wolf effect. So I also change the shape of the low L power, and you're really far away from the data points now. But as I decrease the axial mass, tends to minus 30, 31, 32, 33, you increasingly just look like that bit of cosmological constant that I took out. So the curves go closer and closer to lambda CDM. And by the time you reach 10 to minus 33 electron volts, the purple dotted curve, it really just overlaps the solid green curve. So in this case, for the lighter axions, the limit of um, lambda CDM is the limit that the mass goes to zero. So there are two limits in which you can approach lambda CDM. One where the mass goes to infinity, and one where the mass goes to zero. So clearly, the you're going to then constrain some range of masses in between because the universe looks like lambda CDM. And this is what we now do, um, precisely using the techniques I talked about yesterday, Markov chain Monte Carlo um, parameter estimation. So here is um, a plot from um, our paper in 2017, constraining the density, omega, the cosmic density parameter in axions as a function of the axial mass for different mass bins. So first of all, look at the right hand side. I've got masses, say 10 to the minus 27 and above. They're constrained. These are the ones that look like dark matter. They're constrained to be a small fraction, as you saw, for 20 to the minus 27 or so, 
you don't look like lambda CDM. But as I increase the particle mass, what I'm showing here is, is points sampled from a Markov chain Monte Carlo. The point density represents the probability density because, of, because it's this Markovian process. So as the number of points grows, the bins get higher, and eventually you reach 0.12. So around 10 to the minus 25, 10 to the minus 24, you can't really see the point density well. I will show this better in another plot. You approach omega a h squared equals 0.12, you are all the cold dark matter. You also see this rise at 10 to the minus 33, you think. But in order to make this unambiguous what's going on here, I've colored the point density by the value of a third parameter. The value of the third parameter here is omega cold dark matter. So we see that at the higher axion masses, as the axion density increases, the cold dark matter density drops. Until when the axions are at omega a h squared equals 0.12, the cold dark matter is at zero. So you've opened up a degeneracy. And I'll show this again in a, in a few different ways. But at 10 to the minus 33 V, the axion density climbs, but the cold dark matter density remains unchanged. So let me color it by a different, by a different parameter. For our lighter dark energy like axions, what happened, I now color the, color the points by the parameter omega lambda, and you see the difference. So at 10 to the minus 33 V, as the axion density climbs, the value of omega lambda falls. So at 10 to the minus 33 V, when the axion density is large, Omega a h squared is 0.3 is omega a is 0.7, about. When the axion density becomes large, <coughs> the cosmological constant density has dropped to zero. So this is a there's a di different degeneracy structure at different masses. So these degeneracies make this parameter space relatively nasty. Here, we, I just did bit axion mass bins and then it's relatively easy to deal with. There is a fixed degeneracy structure. If you allow the mass to vary, the degeneracy structure changes, and this makes it quite challenging. So this is just showing that again. I've now binned the axions more coarsely, 10 to the minus 30 to 33, 25 to 30, 25 to 22. And I show scatter points from omega axion versus omega cold dark matter. So in the, in the highest mass bin, there's a degeneracy, a one-to-one -one degeneracy between axions and cold dark matter. In the lowest mass bin, there is no degeneracy between axions and cold dark matter. And in the intermediate mass bin, there's something in between. There's a partial degeneracy. So this is what makes this parameter space challenging. Back in 2013 and 2014, we devised a way to overcome that and do a kind of global scan over the axion mass and the now axion fraction relative to the um, total dark matter fraction. So the, the normalization on the axes changes. And the contours are two and three sigma contours drawn from a, um, this was from a, a nested sampling algorithm, not from um, a Markov chain, but they're qualitatively similar. So then again, you see this, this U-shaped structure and what you see now that we've got this global fit, this global scan, is that 10 to the minus 25 EV cannot be all the dark matter. This doesn't reach one. It's somewhat constrained. But once you get to 10 to the minus 24 EV, as far as the CMB is concerned, that those light acts, anything heavier than that is allowed to be all the dark matter. And anything lighter than 10 to the minus 83 EV is allowed to be all, the, all of the dark energy. This was the Planck 2013 and a galaxy power spectrum. Moving on, we did this uh, for the full uh, CMB from the Planck 2016 release using temperature polarization and lensing in the adiabatic mode. We did also do iso curvature, but I won't discuss that. So we talked about it enough yesterday. Now, we just used the binned technique, and now I have actually shaded the, within the bin according to the point density. So you see that this 10 to the minus 25 bin does not go as high in its point density as 10 to the minus 24, but you see basically the same, um, same U-shaped structure. 
So we get really precision constraints on the axial density between 10 to minus 32 and 10 to minus 25 UV. Uh, so we're, we're saying you know, the dark matter cannot contain very much of these things. It's just like a hot dark matter constraint. You might wonder why, uh, why you should care about these things if they're not all of the dark matter. The reason is that the prediction from a gut scale decay constant is way down here. It is way, well, okay, on a log scale, it would be way down here. We are not yet reaching the precision to test the prediction from the, say, string models. So you, let's say you had, a, had um, a string theory compactification gave you loads of axions and the decay constants were about the gut scale. You would predict that these light axions across these seven orders of magnitude are still living a good order of magnitude in density below where our current constraints are. So we are not yet probing the, the prediction. If you like, you never thought these things should be all the dark matter. So it's, and I'll show a, a plot that kind of emphasizes that next time. Um, there is still important constraints to do at these low masses. And these can also be involved in tensions with the Hubble constant, tensions with lensing, things like this that you may have heard of. So these can still resolve problems, subdominant components like this can resolve problems in cosmology, tensions. Okay. Yeah. You remind why there is a seemingly lower bound, especially for the um, here, why it doesn't go all the way to zero. Uh, that's because you've marginalized over some degeneracy direction. So you're always going to pick a segment when you do that marginalization. You're always going to live somewhere in the middle of the degeneracy direction. And you don't get all the way to, to zero on either side. But it's consistent with zero at, you know, two sigma. So it's not a significant um, rise. But your model prefers. No, it's, it's, pure, it's, it's purely coming from the prior weight here. So because you don't have any way to distinguish between omega A and omega C here, but in order to project it into this plane, I've had to marginalize over one direction. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's a problem with the sampling, it's a problem with priors, and you should always be careful when there are strong degeneracies because projecting things into one plane brings up spurious things. But any, any non-zero preference is not statistically significant. So, you know, you should just throw it out. Um, but it, it has to do with, deep, with marginalization of prior weights. Um, yeah, so the central value looks like it's away from zero here. Um, but if you put in the other direction, you would see that there is no preference. Um, yeah. Okay, so this is now the really significant uh, thing for if you care about what is the dominant component of the dark matter. The CMB gives you a really rock solid, absolute lower bound on the dark matter particle mass. I don't know of any more solid or lower um, bound than this. Why is it rock solid? It's rock solid because it's linear physics. We didn't put in any nonlinear scales here at all. We just solved a load of linear equations given the standard initial conditions. And that tells you, the CMB tells you that the dominant component of dark matter is heavier than 10 to the minus 24 EV. You can get around many of the, you know, the nonlinear physics bounds that we'll talk about um, and that give, by changing your nonlinear modeling, for example, changing the temperature of the lime of the forest, how it evolves as a, um, through, through cosmic time. There's nothing you can do to change this bound because it's linear physics and it's the CMB. So, um, I think that's a, a really significant, um, very significant thing. And then we also have actually on dark energy at the, at the lighter values. Uh, this is what I was saying about probing the gut scale. And we'll, we'll see this again, as I said, next time. So now I've colored the point density according to the initial value of the axion field in Planck units. So the gut scale now is about 10 to the minus two in Planck units, so somewhere in the blue region. So, all of our point density for the light um, fields in the belly of the U, we, we call this the U plot and this is the belly. Um, none of these guys are, that we've constrained have sampled low values of the field. Remember that the field, the actual initial field is the misalignment angle times the decay constant. Misalignment angle is 
some uniform num number between minus pi and pi. So it should be about one. Um, well, theta squared should be about one squared. Um, but the decay constant tells you about the UV physics. Um, and these guys have not probed the gut scale. And even 10 to the minus 24 EV, if it's all the dark matter, is still consistent with decay constants above the gut scale. So you really need to start placing precision constraints at 10 to the minus 24 EV and above subdominant components of the dark matter to probe the gut scale initial conditions, dark, dark matter densities that you kind of expected from your um, small volume stream compactification. Okay, now I'm gonna break down our bins in terms of, this is just the 1D posterior on the um, axion density, axion density 1D posterior for different mass bins. You see, um, it's on a log scale, you see that it's consistent um, with zero for the high masses, 10 to the minus 24 EV, um, but the constraints all become quite strong for these intermediate masses. And the bound on the axion density is at 95% confidence in the tightest one of these bins that it has to be less than 0 0.003. That tells you that the fraction of dark matter in these bins is less than 2.5%. I mean, th this is also saying, you know, like why, like why bother placing constraints on subdominant components? Because we're in the era of precision cosmology. We're bounding parameters at percent level. So you can look for subdominant components at the percent level. If you like, you're making percent level tests of lambda CDM. Or the, is the assumption of lambda CDM that the dark matter is one thing correct and to, and to within what precision? And so we're testing that now at the percent level. And this will improve, I'll show in a few slides, to the sub percent level in, coming, in the coming years. So it, to, the, to the extent where you could detect a percent level departure from lambda CDM at more than five sigma confidence. In, with upcoming CMB experiments, and I'll show that in a few slides. So now I can try and let me just take one of these bins. I take the strongest constraint one, 10 to the minus 26 EV, and break down what happens to the posterior, including different observables, different components of the total CMB information. So the black line is using just the temperature power. Using the temperature plus polarization, so the uh, dot dashed purple line it improves that bound by a factor of about two or a few. Interestingly, however, including the lensing weakens that bound. So that tells you that possibly there is a preference in the lensing, very, very marginally. The lensing does not place a stronger constraint by itself on these light particles. And this is why they could be involved in some of these large, large scale lensing discrepancies. We have this one. But when you use the total information, temperature polarization, lensing, baryon acoustic oscillations, the improvements over the temperature in the 95% limit is about a factor of two. You get more for including more, more um, information. On that point, let's talk about lensing. So this is the um, reconstructed all sky map of the lensing convergence from Planck, which I'll explain what that is in a minute, has the galaxies mapped out. And I really like this because it's really a map over the entire sky on degree scales of the projected dark matter density. And I, I just think that's amazing. Um, but how can we use it to place constraints on um, physics? Why is lensing important? So what is CMB lensing? CMB lensing, light from the CMB, is lensed by the large scale structure on the line of sight. So here's this cartoon. CMB, light ray comes from the CMB to us but it gets lensed by all the structure on the line of sight and deflected somewhat from its original position. What does that look like in maths? So here's the first part of the diagram. Here's some light coming from the CMB. This diagram's from Lewis and Chaloner's excellent review on this subject. The, um, the light comes from the CMB. It gets deflected by the gravitational potential by some angle, and then it comes to us. It gets deflected at a... Um, co-moving distance from us chi and the CMB is at a co-moving distance chi star. So you need to integrate this effect for potential elements all the way along the line of sight from chi star 
um, equals from k equals k star c and b to k zero today. So the total deflection angle alpha is minus two times the co-moving distance times the gradient of the Newtonian potential integrated with respect to the co-moving distance along the line of sight. So from this, you can work out the lensing matrix, just the same one that you might be familiar with from any um, weak lensing or micro lensing. And this is the lensing matrix, uh, the, the unit matrix plus the derivative of um, alpha with respect to the two coordinates on the sky, um, on the lens plane. And this gives you the matrix that defines the shear components, gamma, and the convergence kappa. The convergence kappa is the thing that we can measure in the CMB. The convergence kappa is given by the divergence of the deflection angle. It's proportional to the divergence of the deflection angle. So you can estimate this lensing convergence and you can make a power spectrum of it. So we make the power spectrum of the lensing convergence. It looks like this. This is now the power spectrum of matter fluctuations, which is related to the power spectrum of potential fluctuations using the Poisson equation. This is where the omegas and h's come from. So I basically just take the power spectrum of the um, Newtonian potential with the correct factors of gradients and k's, apply the Poisson equation and integrate it along the line of sight. This gives me my CL, which I defined um, in the last lecture, for the convergence kappa. And it's given by this. The integral along the line of sight of the matter power. So the power spectrum of the lensing convergence basically depends on the matter power spectrum. I should have replaced K in here with a function of L and K, um, but you can look it up in Lewis and Chaloner. And the point of this is you can estimate this power spectrum from the four point functions of the CMB. So convergence correlates the deflection of this light ray and this light ray will be correlated if they pass past the same bit of large scale structure. So if you take a four point function, you can estimate how much the overall convergence was, even if you don't know the original location because of the correlations of the different light rays. So you can estimate this power spectrum. I won't show what the estimator is, but the, but the important thing is that it depends on the power spectrum along the line of sight in a really unambiguous way. It just measures the matter power spectrum. It's not like the um, galaxy power spectrum where you have to worry about where are galaxies, where, how do they form. Lensing just measures the power spectrum along the line of sight. And so it's affected by our axion physics. So recall that the um, light axions suppress the matter power spectrum using this gene scale. So this is the axion gene scale. And the power is strongly suppressed relative to CDM on, on the gene scale for K larger than the gene scale as a quality. So you can use this and the expression for the uh, lensing convergence power spectrum to compute the lensing convergence power spectrum in um, axion models. And it looks like this. So this is the power spectrum of the lensing potential. It's related to the power spectrum of the convergence with some factors of L. And here it is, it has this shape, this peak at quite large angular scales. It's the typical angular scale of matter fluctuations, which is the angular size of the horizon at the matter radiation quality or thereabouts. So you have this peak and then the power drops off. And if your axions are heavier than about 10 to minus 22 EV, this structure just converges to what it looks like in lambda CDM. But for lower masses, minus 25, minus 24, you start to, this is now delta CL over CL as a function of multipole moments. So say 10 to minus 24 EV at multipoles greater than 2000, departs from lambda CDM at kind of the 10% level. So if you could measure the lensing power spectrum at better than 10% precision at high multipole, you could improve the lower bound on the axion mass. But why didn't we see that in Planck, why didn't lensing give us this fantastic improvement in the um, axion density, or how can we use lensing in the future? It didn't, because the high L power is subject to nonlinearities. 
So this is a plot again from this review by Lewis and Chaloner. This is the lensing potential power spectrum. Now it's running log space, but it's the same as what I had before. And the linear theory is in black, and the nonlinear theory is in dotted red. And you notice that they depart at the 10% level for L only a few hundred. So the lensing power becomes contaminated with nonlinear physics at relatively low L, and that's because it, the lensing power was this integral of the matter power spectrum with you know, some various factors of um, the co-moving distance. And so if you put in a nonlinear scale of 0.1 or 1 in this megaparsec, this transfers into an L of a few hundred. So the lensing power is contaminated with nonlinearity. So here is the measurement of the lensing power spectrum by Planck, South Pole Telescope, and Asakama Cosmology Telescope. Great, we've got precision measurements of the, power, of the lensing power spectrum all the way up to L of 1,000, 2,000. We should be able to place better bounds on the axions. But the Planck, the, Planck, um, the guide to using Planck data tells you don't use multipoles larger than 500 because only the multipoles less than 500 can adequately be used with uh, linear, linear physics. Everything greater than 500 contaminated the nonlinearities and was not used in our analysis. So we'd like to use it. If we could use high L lensing, then future CMB measurements in particular that are going to measure the lensing power spectrum out to like 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 in L, could really improve the bound on axions. And in this nice clean lensing just measures the lensing just measures the matter density kind of way. What does this look like? I'm going to show a couple of confusing plots. The first one is I want to compare apples with apples. I want to show you what improvement you will get with a future survey, doing some kind of forecast. So I'm going to make a forecast of Planck. So let's imagine Planck didn't happen. I'm going to use the same technology to make a forecast of what Planck would see so you can see the difference between the two. So this is what Planck would be forecasted to see. So I'm showing uh, fiducial points in a, in a Fisher matrix at different values of omega, different values of the matter density. And I size the blob by how many sigma you would be able to tell the difference between this, um, this fiducial point in lambda CDF. Uh, so in Planck, you get kind of, you know, about one or two sigma constraints at 10 to the minus 25 EV, but above that, nothing. And you don't get any five sigma blobs um, any, anywhere in this plot. You're not really able to distinguish anything from lambda CDM. Well, certainly not at the you know, below 10% level at five sigma. But when we go to a CMB stage four, like CFA, the plot changes dramatically. Um, first of all, this is my statement that you can detect test lambda CDM at kind of the five sigma level. This 1% um, fiducial value would be detected as being different from lambda CDM at greater than five sigma. So, you, so if, even if you had a 1% departure from lambda CDM, you detect it very high significance. But for the purposes of fuzzy dark matter, the important thing is that this tank out of information only occurs now at 10 to the minus 22 EV rather than 10 to the minus 25, rather than 10 to the minus 24 EV. So you've improved the lower bound of dark matter from the CMB by two orders of magnitude if you can use high L lensing. This is what it looks like in a slightly different plot in the, in the U. This U plot is the fiducial points. The boxes are what you would get for Planck and the uh, dots are what you would get for the Simons Observatory. So again, you see now at 10 to the minus 23, you can't get all the way to being all the dark matter. So you get some bound even at 10 to the minus 23 that was equivalent to your 10 to the minus 25 bound roughly with Planck. So you get this and the error bars all shrink. So you get a nice improvement if you can use higher lensing. This has been looked at in the extreme by um, Guyan and um, collaborators at Stony Brook. So they're now imagining that what if we could measure the power spectrum up to L of 10 to the four? And they used some nonlinear modeling to do this. 
yeah, L of 10 to the 4 with some futuristic survey that it's like a, you put the CMB stage 4 uh, detectors on something like the large millimeter telescope. You could do this. So they show that FDM even at 10 to the minus 22 EV would be significantly different from cold dark matter. So here's the cold dark matter power in cyan and the FDM power in purple. So, so they say with this, this type of instrument, CMB stage 4 on the large millimeter telescope with 0.1 microkelvin um, noise, 400 square degree survey, you could tell the difference between FDM and CDM. So this is nice. This is about as far as you can push the CMB. But you could, you could test the fuzzy dark matter model in the CMB, which is a very clean tool if you can model nonlinearity. Of course, you can apply this to other observables. So this is kind of what we're going to look at um, in, the next, in the next few slides, is other observables. The CMB isn't the only game in town. The linear scales in the CMB are almost done. And we need to worry about nonlinearities. So why not worry about other nonlinear observables? So this is the plot that we had um, already in, in lecture five, I think. The matter power spectrum, it's the clustering of matter, the function of wave number, has this nice characteristic shape, turnover at matter radiation quality, barrier acoustic oscillations on linear scales. But wave numbers larger than about 0 0.1, 0 0.2 in this megaparsecs are now, they projected things onto the linear power spectrum here, but you're, these are really nonlinear scales, and this projection from nonlinear scales to linear power is subject to a lot of modeling uncertainty. And the two um, surveys shown in, this is this plot is from the Planck uh, 2018 release, the two bits of data they show that probe these scales are the Barrier Acoustic Oscillation Survey, BOSS data release now in Lyman Alpha Forest Flux Power Spectrum in purple, and the DARES Dark Energy Survey, Year One Cosmic Shear um, Lensing Survey. Both of these go out to wave numbers of about one in this megaparsec, significantly further than the Planck 5.5 Planck lensing, which only goes to about 0.2. So we can get about an order of magnitude further in wave number, which is going to give us about, so remember that the axion gene scale goes like um, the axion mass to the power of half. So an order of magnitude in wave number is two orders of magnitude in axion mass. So this is, this is basically bridging the gap between 10 to the minus 24 EV, the linear probes, the Planck, um, Planck linear probes, and fuzzy dark matter. These two orders of magnitude, you need to do nonlinear modeling, and you can do it with, for example, the Lyman Alpha Forest and Cosmic Shear. And this is basically the end of the Boss Lyman Alpha Forest. DR9 is the final, I think, is the final Boss release. But DES um, will continue to do more releases, so these. Uh, yellow error bars are going to get better. And I like lensing. And um, we're going to talk about both of these, both of these probes in the next half of the lecture. Um, so before we move on to nonlinear scales, is there any questions about the CMB constraints? Yeah. Maybe I misunderstood something, but a few slides ago, when um, at some point you showed that there is a lower, uh, lower bound for the excellent mass of 10 to the minus 24. Yeah. Uh, so I didn't understand why then do we look at excellent masses lower than 10 to the minus 24. So it's the lower bound if it is all the dark matter. So um, I'll come back to that slide for you. Right. Um, yeah. So it's the lower bound if you're all the dark matter. So consistent with the CMB, omega a h squared has to reach this, this value up here. So this is the square root. This is 0.13. Um, so you have to be, if you want to be all the dark matter, you'd better be heavier than that. But all the lighter guys can be there, but they have to be subdominant. And as I said, the sub, their, their subdominance is predicted if you like, by the input scale. So you haven't really ruled out much of theory space yet, but there's still quite a long way to go. OK. 
Okay. But of course, it would be surprising if you had seen anything because you'd have some evidence of some, you know, almost Planckian in um, the K constant. Okay, so um, nonlinear scales, fuzzy dot matter and galaxy formation. Um, I'm going to recap a little bit of what um, Daniel told us already this morning um, in less detail. And I'm going to, some of the things I'll say will come up again um, in Jens's lectures in the coming days. Uh, but hopefully there'll be too much repetition or good repetition anyway, so you're all, it's all hammered home. Okay, so fuzzy dark matter and galaxy formation. As Daniel told us, galaxy formation is nonlinear. So we can probe the nonlinear scales, good, improve our bounds and axions, but nonlinear physics is, is high. So um, galaxies form inside dark matter halos, which are nonlinearly bound. I say all question mark here because um, it could well be that, for example, um, well, in fact, there was this evidence recently for a galaxy that didn't have a dark matter halo. Globular clusters may not have dark matter halos. This is, of course, consistent with the theory of dark matter because dark matter is a thing. It can be somewhere or not be somewhere. So there are places where it isn't. Um, and you can have star formation in places where there isn't dark matter, as long as the total mass of the uh, gas exceeds the barium genes mass. So, so, so most galaxies form inside dark matter halos, but not necessarily all of them. Uh, this is actually a motivation early on, um, I think in one of the early papers by Peebles on variations of the fuzzy dark matter model. One of the motivations for it was in cold dark matter, you have halos all the way down, turtles all the way down. There are dark matter halos on all mass scales. But Peebles said, if you had a cutoff in the halo mass function, like we saw in Daniel's plots. This might explain why there are things like globular clusters that don't live in dark matter halos um, if they're below the cutoff. So it's actually quite, so you can explain certain observations um, in this framework. Okay, so uh, what can we do to deal with nonlinear physics? Um, we could do embody simulations. Um, so at low redshift, this might seem to work for fuzzy dark matter because the actual gene scale is much larger than the gene scale at quality. So I gave you those two expressions before. The gene scale today is much smaller than the gene scale at quality. So the gene scale is where all the fuzzy dark matter physics is happening, where the pressure is. But this is much smaller than the scale where the power spectrum is cut off. So if you're only interested in the power spectrum, you can probably just do n-body simulations with modified initial conditions. And this is what was done to get the Lyman alpha forest constraints that I'll show, for example. So on large scales, you can just take the linear power spectrum, modify initial conditions, do an n-body simulation. You're on scales much larger than the gene scale. This is, what's ha this is what happens in the hybrid simulations that Bodo talked about um, and that were published by uh, Bodo and Jan and Jens. Uh, there, the large scales can just be modeled as an n-body. Um, with the right initial conditions, and you'll get things pretty much right. You can then start to modify the dynamics if you want to get more of the fuzzy dark matter, um, more of the fuzzy dark matter physics. So you can include, include either the quantum pressure, the Madeleine formation, or psi, this could be a psi in the Schrodinger equation. This modified dynamics changes the internal structure of the halos and the filaments. It gives you um, interference patterns, soliton formation, all the stuff, um, dynamical friction, um, heating, all the things we've talked about in Jens's lectures and in the, in the lectures by Jan and Bodo. Um, this is really the full picture. As we heard, it's hard to do this on all scales. Uh, or the alternative is to use semi-analytic models. And this is what Daniel told you about this morning. And they're useful because they try and capture elements of both of these um, first two, but in a way that can be done um, you know, many, many times. It's not as expensive as a, as a full-scale simulation. So you get things like the halo mass function. You model the density profiles. You can use heating. You can put in effective heating, etc. And you can use these to try and access your cosmological observables. So just to show examples of these things. Uh, this is uh, the uh, simulations done in the Madelung formulation in the Skagit code by Nori and Baldi. And they show 
the, the dark matter structure using CIC, cold dark matter initial conditions. Okay, you've got structure on all scales. Then they show the effect of either using the fuzzy dark matter initial conditions or the quantum pressure or both. So quantum pressure, fuzzy dark matter initial conditions. The, it's, quite, it's not very easy to see in this. I encourage you to go and look at my slides and zoom in on the pictures yourself. I'll go to the paper. But the difference between cold dark matter initial conditions and fuzzy dark matter initial conditions, you get rid of some of the structure. But the adding in the quantum pressure doesn't do all that much to this. So, the, so on these large scales, you know, um, tens of megaparsecs, one to, tens, one to 10 megaparsecs, most of the effect of fuzzy dark matter is captured by just changing the initial conditions. So this is why you can, for the purpose of Lyman off forest, for example, pretty much just do end body simulations. Um, but of course, we don't get the right small scale structure in none of these pictures is there interference patterns along fringes, and that's because that is something that you cannot model in the application. So the details are different, but the large scale structure, basically the power spectrum um, of these things would be the same. Then you can do the next level of, of sophistication, um, but the brute force method, which um, Chive et al did, um, again, you've seen this picture now many times, this solves the Schrodinger equation in the, um, using this gamer um, GPU software. <coughs> Brute force solves the Schrodinger equation, gives you everything, but really not repeatable. You can't do this a lot of times. You can't do it in big boxes. And body simulations are the, the cheapest way of doing the nonlinear physics. Mm -hmm. This is the most expensive way of doing it, but it gets you everything. It gets you the interference patterns, it gets you the soliton formation. Um, so you want to try and bridge between these two, um, and that's where the semi-analytic models come in. So now I'm going to repeat a little bit of what Daniel said. Um, press check the theory. Uh, um, so halos are assumed to form at density maxima, passing some threshold. So here is some random field um, delta drawn from some delta in distribution, um, and then coordinates x, and everywhere this field passes the critical density which is um, the, the linear theory value with the growth factor, halo is form. So here's delta critical, and we just threshold the field, and we would say, okay, I would expect the halo here, here, and here. Okay, that's the idea behind pressure factor, and extended pressure factor. So the, the, the object that you need is the variance. This is the variance. The variance is given by the integral of the mass of power spectrum over all k with some windowing function. So you get the variance on the scale r. So you're smoothing this field in real space with some window r, and the statistics of that are described in the power spectrum integrated in k space. Okay, so we can relate the scale r to a typical mass scale from the enclosed mean mass if I use a spherical window function, I will. And this is now the um, standard deviation with square root of the variance as a function of the mass for fuzzy dark matter. So the black curve is lambda CDM, the variance just continues to rise at small masses. So this is why, um, as Daniel told us, you get more and more structure as the mass goes to zero, because as the mass goes to zero, the variance just blows up. So the, you have lots and lots of very small scale peaks. But with fuzzy dark matter, we have a suppression. So I've allowed the fraction of fuzzy dark matter to vary 10%, 50%, 100%. 100% the variance flattened. And the variance flattens relative to lambda CDM on the mass scale corresponding to the gene scale of the quality. So yes, here should be sigma. Um, okay, so that's what fuzzy dark matter does in terms of pressure, that kills the variance. So then if you use the original pressure um, formula, you do spherical collapse, um, and you, you use your error functions, you can work out the halo mass function. So the halo mass function, dn v log m, the number of halos per logarithmic mass bin, is just given by this very simple formula in terms of the variance. So it depends on the mass. So you can just take those variants I got before, plug it into this formula, and find out what the halo mass function is. 
pressure, the theory gives an analytic handle on the mass function. That's why it's useful. You could get the mass function from a simulation, but pressure actor gives us an analytic handle on it, tells us what's going on physically. And so here it is. This is again now, you saw this plot in, in Daniel's talk. The halo formation is strongly suppressed at low masses. So here I've got CDM in dotted lines, um, fuzzy dot matter 10 to minus 22 EV in solid lines. Uh, the mass function is a function of redshift. So at redshift zero, you've got some suppression and then a turnover. The suppressed relative to cold dark matter on mass scales below 10 to the 8 or so solar masses. As it goes to higher redshift, that suppression becomes stronger. Halos really don't want to form at high redshift um, in fuzzy dark matter. And this is significant for observations. So you can compute the halo mass function in many different ways, including different physics. And as the semi analytic models get as complicated. Um, as Daniel talked about with stripping um, and was um, the subject of Zhao Long's uh, thesis and, and papers. You can also compute it in simulations, including various different bits of physics in your simulations. Um, but there hasn't been anything that has computed this mass function using all the relevant physics, the quantum pressure, as well as the initial condition. <laughs> and that's because of the challenge in doing the large simulations with quantum pressure. So, no, none of the models agree in detail on what the mass function is, but they all agree qualitatively it turns over relative to CDM below this uh, mass. It's the gene scale inequality. So we can use this to get some constraints. We need to make contact to observations though. So uh, the mass function and the nonlinear power spectrum need to be related to observables. Uh, this requires more modeling. Um, so there's reionization. So the, once we know where there are halos and what redshift they're at, we can say, how does star formation happen in them? This is where you need lots of modeling because you can either simulate the baryons, which is expensive, or do lots and lots of modeling for star formation. We can get constraints from the reionization of the universe, the formation of the first galaxies. You model the gas temperature on top of the mass function. Then you can relate it to um, the line off the forest or the 21 centimeter um, or other intensity mapping surveys. If you include on top of the halo mass function a model for the density profile, this thing we've seen a few times now, the soliton plus NFW, you need this in order to model properly the, the lensing power spectrum. And I'm going to discuss um, all three of these. Uh, the first two will be done again um, later on by Jens. Okay, so let's try and do the equivalent of CMB lensing. Lensing is great. You don't need to care about bias. Um, um, you don't need to care about gas physics. You just need to know where's the, where's the matter, where's the dark matter. Um, or you care less about gas physics. Um, AGN feedback does, does affect this. Um, but it's a clean measure. It's a clean measure, measure of matter density. So cosmic shear. Um, so lensing along the line of sight shears galaxy shapes. So galaxies you know, in their rest frame are relatively circular, um, or spiral galaxies are relatively circular in their rest frame. But as the light from a, from a spiral galaxy comes to us along the line of sight, it gets sheared by the intervening matter. So it becomes more elliptical. And by correlate, if you see correlated shear of galaxies, then you can use that to estimate the total lensing potential on the line of sight. Even if you don't know their intrinsic shape, if there's a correlation between the shear of different nearby galaxies, you could estimate the lensing along the line of sight. Um, it's a complicated process, but you can write down the power spectrum of the cosmic shear relatively simply from theory. Measuring it is very hard in practice. Um, it, it, it's amazing that it can be done if you see the, the images that are worked with by, for example, Euclid or Des. It's, it's amazing that they can do this, they can measure this, but theoretically it looks relatively simple. So this is the cosmic shear correlation function, psi, between two redshift bins, i and j. Um, there are two different components to it, the plus and minus, labeled by the Bessel function index here. And it's a function of angular scale theta. It's given by this, um, 
double integral, and I haven't written the integration variables, I apologize. Um, presuming there's an integral d chi and an integral d l. I should have written integral d chi, integral d l here. Um, apologies. So given by this expression where p is the nonlinear matter power spectrum, and the rest is just geometry. Q is the lensing efficiency, which relates to your survey, and the redshift being I and J. So for your survey measures galaxies at, say, 10 different redshifts, and they bin them, and they compute the correlation in the lensing between bin 1 and bin 2 and bin 3 and bin 4 and bin 1 and bin 5, and so on and so on, as a function of angular scale. And this measures the nonlinear power spectrum. This is what it looks like. For example, in the Des in the Desier one release, this is uh, psi minus between bin one one two 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 one. So they've got four redshift bins, and they get all the cross correlations. This is what's known as tomography. Um, so you measure different redshift bins, and you see that this correlation function, you know, has some shape. The blue line is what's predicted by the best fit lambda CBM model, and the dots are the measurements. So you see, you know, how you can fit your model. You change your parameters like omega matter, like the fuzzy dark matter mass, and it changes the shape of P, which thus changes the same shape of psi. So you can constrain these parameters. And what they're showing here, I think, is the white region is the nonlinear scales and the gray region is the linear scales, um, if I'm remembering correctly. So there's information in the nonlinear scales that you can use to get constraints. And they're on theta in arc minutes, you know, kind of tens to hundreds of arc minutes. Um, you can make Okay. So this is measured by DES. The tools that I described to get constraints from the CMB, Markov chain Monte Carlo, and something like Cosmosis, can be used to get these constraints. Um, it's exactly the same procedure as the CMB, um, but the challenge is correctly modeling the nonlinear power, which is the point of what we've just been talking about all this time. One way to do this is the um, HALO model. It's a semi-analytic model. Um, gives you a possible expression for P of K that is crucially faster than doing a simulation, fast enough to do market chain Monte Carlo with. This is the power spectrum, the dimension of power spectrum delta k cubed of k. You model it as a two halo term and a one halo term. We're going to focus on the one halo term. The two halo term is pretty much the linear power spectrum with some corrections to do with halo bias. The one halo term is fully nonlinear physics. And this is where I want to show you now all the things we've discussed coming in. It depends on two things the one halo term. It depends on the halo mass function, dn by dm, which we know how to get from the semi-analytic models and from the Schechter. And so it obviously measures the, um, this cutoff in the mass function will affect the one halo term. But it also depends on this function w, which in this notation is it's the spherical Fourier transform of your density profile. So you need to the, to the one halo term, as well as depending on the mass function, also depends on the density profile. So you need, that's, that's what I said, you need an extra layer of modeling. You can't just use the mass function. You also need to know about these solitons inside the density profile to get this right. Um, so yeah, both ingredients need, are needed, and you need to model P of K correctly. And also you're not going to get this bit the deep nonlinear effects of the density profile from a pure end body simulation. So a pure end body simulation probably gives you dn by dm, right? And this up to some scale k, correct? But really you should be getting the right density profiles and these depend on the, um, on the non, on the um, beyond end body physics, the Madelung or the Schrodinger. So, Nothing as of yet, no simulations have given us what should be the full picture of this. And this is, again, the importance of the semi-analytic modeling. You can put in a density profile with some model and see whether it affects your observables. So you know whether to bother going and doing the simulation. And none of this has really been put together um, fully by anybody yet. 
So, moving on, other things we can do with the mass function. Uh, you can use the mass function to study cosmic ionization. So, this is a cartoon of ionization from an article in Scientific American by Adi Loeb. So, this is the state of the universe. This is the CMB on the left hand side and us today on the right hand side. At the CMB, hydrogen went neutral, recombination happened, photons started to freely propagate. Then, at some redshift around 10, the first stars started to form and they started to ionize the gas around them. So, the ionization started to happen. Um, hydrogen started to become ionized, doubly ionized, H2, um, in bubbles. And eventually, these, this, this, these bubbles percolate and the universe becomes completely ionized somewhere around redshift, redshift 6. And the universe is and then ionized from redshift 6 down to redshift 0. So, the formation of the first galaxies reionizes the universe. If galaxies live in dark matter halos, which we've seen, um, and in fuzzy dark matter, there are fewer <laughs> low mass halos at high redshift, reionization should happen later because galaxy formation happens later. So, this can give us a constraint. How do you do it? Um, this will again be gone over again by, by Jens. You can do it um, one way to do it, so called abundance matching. I say that all five, which is my, my sources of UV flux with magnitude and UV, each one is living inside a halo of mass M. Every source of UV flux lives in a halo of mass M. Um, just by counting that the number of sources has to equal the number of halos, I can get a relationship between the halo mass and the UV flux, the UV magnitude. If you do this, you can plug into the halo mass and get a prediction for the UV flux as a function of redshift. It's UV photons that are doing the reionizing. This is one such plot of what this might look like. So this is the now the integrated flux um, as a function of uh, UV magnitude. Following this model, this was for some body simulations. Um, so here is the cold dark matter prediction at redshift seven. These are the observations, colored for various different observations. Um, and then how this function changes as they change the fuzzy dark matter mass. So if you look at this, you say, okay, these observations, the very faintest magnitudes over here, would disfavor certain fuzzy dark matter masses. So they don't give you quite enough UV flux. This is at redshift seven. So here the data is from Burins, Attic, and Livermore. Um, and the exclusion, you can exclude uh, um, axions at about, one point, at about 10 to the minus 22 EV. Um, I've also shown here a warm dark matter constraint and a late forming dark matter constraint that are relevant. So there, this UV flux argument gives you some constraints on fuzzy dark matter, but it involves a lot of modeling. You need to know the mass function and these relationships here. Here we used an embody simulation, you might use something else. There's a lot of modeling. Um, Realization, um, <coughs> di directly saying what is the neutral um, fraction as a function of redshift. This can also be measured and get constraints. So that UV flux that I showed before, we can integrate that and you can work out the ionizing fraction. Um, this is a theoretical prediction on the left for the ionized fraction as a function of venture. And on the right is the measurement of the neutral fraction. So the measurements on the right are one minus the theoretical prediction on the left. Um, <laughs> and I like this. This is the uh, newest data um, in home by Ma uh, Mason from, 20, from this year. So we know that the universe was neutral. So it was not neutral, it was fully ionized at redshift six. So these data points here show the neutral fraction is very small at redshift six. But, and then these other data um, at higher redshifts around seven and eight show the universe was almost completely neutral at redshifts larger than about seven. The reionization really happened quite quickly in redshift states, between redshift six and redshift eight. This allows us to place some constraints on models. So on the left hand side, the ionized fraction computed for um, fuzzy dark matter, 10 to the minus 22 EV in blue, 10 to the minus 21 EV in purple. 
CDM um, lives between these two curves here. So and there's a lot of modeling uncertainty. The width of these bands is representing the modeling uncertainty. But the, in the case of CDM, only this one curve here is really consistent with um, the realization history we're seeing here. So in the case of CDM, you learn about your modeling by measuring realization. But with um, fuzzy dot matter, you see here, okay, 10 to the minus 22 days consistent with the observations. There's quite a wide range that realizes the universe correctly. But it couldn't. If, if we measured the realization history of the universe, instead this was happening at range of 10 or range of 15, the fuzzy dot matter model would not be consistent with it. <coughs> so, and lighter fuzzy dot matter models would not be consistent with the history we observed. 10 to minus 23, they would be somewhere down here. So, we are, so it's, it's nice, and it's a prediction of the model. So fuzzy dark matter with 10 to minus 22 EV couldn't do anything but reionize the universe at redshift 6 or 7. It didn't have enough halos before that. So it's quite interesting that the prediction of that model, of the you know, classic fuzzy dark matter, 10 to minus 22, 10 to minus 21, is consistent with what we're now seeing, which is this, this constraint migration was the first detection of neither zero nor one ionized fraction at redshift seven. So this is consistent with the fuzzy dark matter model. And it wouldn't have been consistent with anything like that and it was predicted by this model. So that's quite nice. I'm gonna try and collect um, a few more constraints now. Um, I don't know how many slides I have left. Yeah. I think I, I can begin to understand Something. Uh, so you were saying this is like that the UN, uh, the ionization happens at redshift six. Um, the universe is fully ionized by redshift six. Uh, yeah, yeah, so um, it's ionized at six. And um, it's and neutral at redshift eight. <coughs> So it's partially ionized at redshift seven. That's what this yeah. part is showing. Uh, I mean, why should that be like that? I mean, it shouldn't be the other way around. So the universe was um, ionized at redshift above 1100, <coughs> and it became neutral at 1100 when the CMB forms. Then it's neutral from redshift 1100 down to some redshift and then it's ionized again. So that's what this plot's showing it. Neutral, high redshift, ionized at low redshift. It's just because this plot's like one minus this one. And the right hand plot is one minus the left hand plot. So reionization is is possibly a very it's a it's a very good probe of <laughs> Fuzzy dark matter, it you know, you know that nothing really lighter than 10 to the minus 22 EV would be consistent with the ionization history of the universe. So good, you've got, you know, a, a, a you know, order of magnitude um, improvements on your dark matter bound, subject to a lot of modeling, but there's not much you could do if you were 10 to the minus 23 EV to be consistent. Also, interestingly, it could have been measured inconsistent with fuzzy dark matter, but it is consistent. Higher, higher realization redshifts would just have ruled out this one when it didn't. So it's, it's interesting. Um, I'm going to collect in the, in the next 15 minutes, I'm just going to collect a whole bunch of other constraints um, and we'll see how far we get. Um, what am I, I'm going to skip some things and not others. Um, let me skip Hubble Frontier Fields. Um, so Jens may well talk about that. Uh, let me skip formation of Eridanus 2 and Milky Way satellites and Lyman Alpha Forest. No, I can go through all of these, I think. Um, okay, so just remembering where I have to get to. Okay, so uh, Hubble Frontier Fields measured the basic number of, number of satellite, number of galaxies per cubic megaparsec at of 6. This is a plot from Zhao Long's uh, thesis. So the constraint was that the number at three sigma was 
um, not smaller than one log of, log of zero. So as a function of the axial mass in units of tensile mass 22 EV, you just now basically take the halo mass function and you know, integrate it. How many halos do I have? How many did you see in the Hubble frontier field? Are these consistent? I don't know how the statistics are treated in terms of completeness, but assuming you had a representative sample, you just say, okay, as I increase my axial mass, I get more halos. At some point, I have to get inside the measured number of halos in Hubble frontier fields. Uh, Zhao Long includes a few different modelings of the mass function. This is the, the modelling uncertainty within the semi-analytic model. Um, but for his numeric solution, the stark black line, you become consistent with Hubble frontier fields at the few sigma level when the axial mass is a few times 10 to the minus 22 EV, about seven. So this is already a stronger bound, if you like, than, than reionization or anything else we've seen so far. And a slightly stronger bound again um, comes from the formation of Eridanus II. We talked about um, the heating of stars in Eridanus II, um, but this is just from the formation. So you take the mass of Eridanus II, you say, I need to have at least one subhalo in the Milky Way of this mass, you know, statistically. I should, I should be close to this mass and get at least one of them out of my halo mass function. You have to use Zhao Long's semi-analytic model for, that includes stripping um, in order to get the masses right. Um, or for the sharp K filter, you have to use the pre infor mass but okay, now you say number of Eridanus two halos as a function of axion mass had better be larger than one. You cross one at, okay, it's about the same as Hubble frontier fields, a few times 10 to the minus 22, almost 10 to the minus 21 EV. Um, so yeah, I used the strict mass in Zhao Long's merger trees, which were computed using Galacticus, which we had described in the manual. And the Dashed line is using an alternative model, the sharp K filter um, of Schneider, to which you have to shift the pre inform mass. Um, anyway, if you want to get at least one, dwarf, one ultra, ultra faint dwarf galaxy like Eridanus 2, your fuzzy dark matter had better be heavier than about 10 to the minus 21 EV. So we're improving this, this lower bound all the time relative to what we had in the CMB. We're now about three orders of magnitude away from that CMB bound. But all of these nonlinear constraints, one, they're not constraining the fraction. I just fix it to be one and demand it be consistent. So you're not including any of the change in cosmology. Um, and how much statistical significance to assign to such a statement is uh, fuzzy at best. Because the nonlinear modeling is, you know, the, the, the theoretical error coming from that is not really accounted for. And I haven't, you know, given a statistical significance to how many ME2 halos are there and what's my mass function there. Um, so this is certainly not as statistically rigorous as what we would get from, say, the dead lens in analysis. Okay, um, Milky Way satellites. This was again in a paper by Zhao Long. He now just does the same thing, counts. Um, integrates the mass function, counts how many satellites there are. You should get at least the Milky Way satellites that we observe, and they should survive tidal stripping. So um, the, here are the observations. You have to, with your axiom, <coughs> model, you have to live in the colored region in order to survive. So 10 to the minus 22 EV, really there are lots of halos that shouldn't be around that you do observe. So that's probably inconsistent. But 10 to the minus 21 EV, I mean, pretty much all the halos are consistent with what you observe. There's these two outliers that they have large errors. So the bound from this is probably something like M22 plus 10, a mass of 10 to the minus 21 EV. This is also what we get from alpha flash. So really the bound appears to be 10 to the minus 21 EV. Um, but there's lots of uncertainty. Okay, line alpha forest, long standing, long standing standard test of nonlinear power. 
It relies on modeling the gas temperature, which has lots of uncertainties, discussed in the paper by Fubi et al, that Jens has referred to a lot. This is the measurement. This is the flux power spectrum, measured in, I think, FOSD online, um, this high res MIC uh, XP100. Um, at different red shifts, the amount of forest power spectrum is measured, redshift three to redshift five. The um, best fit around the CDM model is solid. An axial mass of 10 to the minus 22, 10 to the minus 21 electron volts is dotted. You see that even 10 to the minus 21 EV is coming into a bit of problem with these power spectrum measurements at large values of K, so small scales. So in the paper by uh, Ershik et al. and in a number of others, um, they derived an a bound of about two to three times 10 to the minus 21 EV. But again, I would stress that there is modeling uncertainty here. But it's order of magnitude the same as the bound we've just got from Eridanus 2, Milky Way satellites, and um, what is the other one? Hubble Frontier Fields, Eridanus 2. Okay. You can also do now, Lamar Alpha Forest, you've got a power spectrum, you've got lots of measurements. Saying that your modeling is okay, you can treat this in the statistically rigorous way that we treated the CMB. Um, and this was done by Kobayashi and the other authors from this paper, Airship the Beal. Um, and here's now the axial fraction um, as a function of the mass derived from the line of the forest. So you get some bound, okay, it goes up to one at a few times 10 to the minus 21, but the overall bound is only about the 10, 20% level. So compared to the CMB, you've improved the lower bound by about three orders of magnitude in mass, but the precision at which you measure the fraction at lower masses is nowhere near as good as the CMB. Um, was at the end of our masses. Okay, in the last five minutes, I will tell you about density profiles. So we've talked about satellites, we've talked about the mass function, and we're now going to talk about the role of the solitons and the so-called cusp core problem in both Serena Galaxy. So, by now you've seen this plot in the number of times, this is from the um, paper by Shiva et al. In, in investigating this core halo mass relation. So um, these are a bun bunch of different halo density profiles as a function of radius um, for many different halos identified at many different redshifts. And all of them, you observe, have this soliton in the middle <laughs> and this outer power law NFW profile. And so what they observed, um, and we've now find, found ways in Jens's lectures to derive um, is the relationship between the central soliton mass and the halo mass. So the central soliton mass is the minimum halo mass, so that's something like the genes mass, um, and then scaled with the mass of your halo relative to that minimum mass to the third power. So more massive halos have more massive solitons, more massive solitons are more compact because they have uh, smaller velocities, sorry, larger velocity dispersions. So, yeah, so you know this, and the size of the solitons is then fixed by the axial mass in the mass. Okay, how can we use this to get constraints and ask about the cost core problem? So you might be able to solve the cost core problem if, the, if this core in your galaxy, in a dwarf galaxy, is smaller than, say, this scale here, about a kiloparsec. So, is the cost core problem a problem? Um, in dwarf steroidals, it appears to be. Um, and here's one way to see it. So, I'm going to use um, this Walker and Peña Rubia method to talk about it. So, you can try and fit density profiles using the so called genes equation, but it has some problems. Um, you can just read about them in Billy and Tremaine. Uh, the velocity only such to be generous. Walker and Peña Rubia employed the relationship to try and measure the slope of the mass profile of a galaxy. So they relate the velocity dispersion at the half-light radius of the stars to the mass, the total mass, including dark matter, internal to the half-light radius of the stars. So you have a population of stars, you measure its velocity dispersion at its half-light radius, you then know how much mass total there is in terms of the half-light radius. 
from this empirical relationship. And then if you have two different populations of stars in the same galaxy, you can get two data points on the mass. Simple. That allows you to measure the slope of the density profile. That's what Walker and Penny Rubia did. They did this in Sculptor and Fornax. They had two distinct populations of stars. <coughs> the slope three on the mass profile corresponds to a core, and slope one corresponds to an NFW cusp. They then fit the slope of the density profile for both Sculptor and Fornax, and they find that it peaks at three and statistically excludes two. So they disfavor an FW cusp at that greater than 95% confidence level. Um, that doesn't mean that you disfavor cold dark matter because you could create the core from um, baryonic physics. But this is the, you know, the CDM only um, core. We would like to say, can we explain this core with fuzzy dark matter? Um, so I did this. We just fit this and um, these data points using the Solitan profile. Monte Carlo over parameters, what we heard about before. Um, oh, the plot I wanted to show you has not showed up for some reason. Okay, but the answer that you get um, is the following. Um, so this is the posterior on the axion mass. The blue and red curves are what you get using this Walker and Pena Rubia method with various different levels of sophistication. Um, and you find that in order to explain the core in Fornax, you have to be lighter than 10 to the minus 22 dB. Both this blue and this red um, curve don't have much probability density um, above 10 to the minus 22 dB. So, um, for comparison, where we did the genes analysis that is biased, we got this peak at, at above 10 to the minus 22 EV, um, but we, we don't believe this, it's a biased analysis. And then I've drawn on here these co a cosmological constraint at 10 to the minus 22 EV. So, you know, we saw a bunch of constraints at 10 to the minus 21 EV. You could twist your cosmology, you could tweak it around, and you could probably lower those by an order of magnitude change your nonlinear model. Like you couldn't get much below 10 to the minus 22 EV if you tried, I don't think. Whereas the, the cores in Forex and Sculptor appear to need um, masses smaller than 10 to the minus 22 EV. So um, it, it doesn't appear that you can get a consistent resolution of cusp core with fuzzy dark matter alone. Of course, that doesn't mean that the model is ruled out just like with CDM, you can get cores from baryonic physics, but you can't get a pure dark matter um, solution to this problem in this model in these galaxies. Um, so yeah, that uh, that's the end of galaxy formation. Um, that's the end of precision cosmology. Tomorrow we will talk about um, we'll talk about a collection of kind of random constraints that didn't fit in anywhere else tomorrow. Um, th but there'll be other, there'll be purely gravitational probes. So we'll still be in the realm of astrophysics and cosmology. We're going to do pulsar timing arrays. We're going to do black hole super radiance. And we're going to do gravitational microlensing. We're going to do fuzzy dark matter and the QCD axion. It's going to be a bit of a mixed bag tomorrow. Um, and then Thursday and Friday, we'll come on to direct detection. Um, which is pretty exciting. Um, so we're going to change gears quite a lot. So any questions now on precision cosmology, structure formation? Yeah. I, something. I don't know, maybe it's, it's including some of these uh, approaches, but you have looked for galaxies, high redshift, survey of these, which you are not predicted to be distinguished. Yeah. Is that something people look at? Yeah. Um, so a measure of that is the UV luminosity function that I showed. It's not obvious to, to me, uh, at least exactly how that, um, how that corresponds to the number of galaxies, Exa but that's what that is. That UV luminosity function. Um, so the highest the region, region the um, it was in the reionization part, but it, it was this luminosity function. The luminosity function is, is 
how many galaxies are there? What's the total flux yeah, of UV photons yeah. coming from high redshift? Yeah, but these are not I showed a, I showed a plot up to seven. Yeah. Uh, we used data up to ten, but there the um, the data isn't as good. There are fewer galaxies, as larger scatter. Um, and this, of course, will improve a lot with, for example, JWST. So uh, JWST will get, I think, magnitude limited at like redshift 14, 15 or something. Um, so like if JWST saw basically any galaxies at redshift 15, you would rule out the 10 to the minus 22 and probably 10 to the minus 21 EV model. I mean, on the other hand, um, within the, you know, once you've fixed your reionization model in CDM, you then predict that you should see probably some galaxies at those high redshifts. So you could also use this as a way to say, do you disfavor CDM? If you don't see any galaxies at high, if you see galaxies, no. if you don't see any galaxies at high redshift, the CDM would have predicted this could, you know, in a few years time be more evidence for the fuzzy dark matter model. There have been some claims of uh, such a turnover in an analysis of, the, of uh, I think, like the lensing of the Hubble Frontiers field by uh, Shive Broadhurst and company, um, so the Taiwanese um, and Basque group that did the these famous simulations that we've seen. They, they have claimed that there is some evidence for a turnover, um, but it, it depends on how you analyze the data. So the faint magnitude end is subject to some controversy. So some of the data points I show, I think they're Livermore, um, like Livermore's redshift 8 data actually shows a big rise in the UV luminosity function at faint magnitudes, but even higher than CDM, so even more galaxies than CDM, but though those data are subject to some controversy. Um, and then the Hubble Frontiers field, I think, um, lens analysis of Shiva and Broadhurst saw more of a turnover. So the faint magnitudes are not a done and dusted um, area, because you're looking not just for galaxies at those high redshifts, but faint galaxies um, to low mass, um, yeah. faint galaxies at high redshift. Uh, so, but it is something that will improve certainly with JWST. Um, I think W first as well, but I'm not sure exactly what the future data state will be. Um, 21 centimeter, dark ages, 21 centimeter. Um, you know, any confirmation of anything like edges, um, though, all these kinds of intensity mapping reionization stuff will test this picture quite strongly. Yeah. These ones. So these one um, so these constraints on the on the board um, are just in the local universe. And so in the Milky Way, so you know redshift zero. Um, and it's trying to explain the cusp core problem in these particular two galaxies. Um, you could try and look at the cusp core problem at different um, in other galaxies. So, for example, there is a cusp core problem in clusters, which are of course at, at high redshift. But these um, that definitely cannot be explained by fuzzy dark matter. Um, the density profiles would be different at high redshift. I don't know. I don't know how much we know about density profiles of you know, small galaxies outside of our own. I, not, right, nothing. There's not. There's no. There's no way you could really measure them. You could get um, LSBs though, right? I don't know what redshift LSBs go to. Right. Yeah, so here you get most departure from CDM, formation of cores in dwarf galaxies, which are low mass. So they're typically satellites of the, <coughs> satellites of the Milky Way. All the other galaxies that we see, things like um, ellipticals, low surface brightness, spiral clusters that are at higher redshift, where, yeah, you could have some evolution 
Um, fuzzy dot matter is going to look just like cold dot matter. Cusp core problems in those galaxies, in this case, would have to be resolved by baryonic physics. Um, if you have a particle physics solution, self-interacting dark matter with velocity dependent cross sections works. But yeah, here it's just this is just redshift so local universe. So no more questions on structure formation. I uh, will end today and I'll see you all again tomorrow. Thank <laughs> you.